Hello, I'm Johnny from Eurogamer. Some of you will know me from this channel and my exploits on here. Alright, so here is a slice of shroom cake from Paper Mario, and here goes nothing. <coughs> wow. That's f***ing disgusting. While others may know me as the Dungeon Master for Outside Xbox and Outside Extra. So everyone's going to roll for initiative. Roll a d20 and your initiative. I have lost my dice. Oh. One of the loveliest things about running Dungeons & Dragons for those channels has been the reaction from you nice people, especially those who have been inspired to give pen and paper games a go for themselves. But running a pen and paper role playing game can be an intimidating business. It's hard to know what game to run, how to get started, and how to keep a game going without getting bogged down in rules minutiae, or accidentally killing all of your player characters in their first combat encounter. Unless that's something you're planning to do, of course. So to help any budding DMs get off the starting blocks, here are a few tips for running a pen and paper role-playing game, according to me. I talked about it in a previous video called Why Every Gamer Should Try Pen and Paper, but the most important thing to ensure when you're preparing to run a pen and paper game is that you're playing a game everyone is excited about. It sounds really obvious, but I cannot stress how important it is to pick a setting that's right for your players in terms of the stories they want to tell, and also just one they're interested in. Lots of people gravitate towards D&D as their first RPG because it's the one they've heard of, but to be honest, Dungeons & Dragons isn't for everyone. It's an accessible world because everyone can picture an orc or a wizard, but if the idea doesn't have you all raring to go, pick something else. Making sure everybody's on the same page doesn't just mean picking a good setting, however. It's also important to consider how serious your game will be before you run it, because if you're expecting to run a super gritty, noir thriller with hard-boiled characters and really deadly enemies, and your players are expecting a ridiculous romp through the woods with goofy characters and silly names, everyone's in for a bit of a shock when you get going. When talking about the game you're going to play, be sure to establish the tone you're going for and what motivates your players. Is it number crunching and loot gathering, or is good characterization more important? Similarly, if there's any subject matter that ought to be considered off the table, this is a good time to establish it. Talking about these things up front is a good way to make sure everybody knows what they're getting themselves in for. Difficulty is also something you should bear in mind. Some players relish having to fight just to stay alive from hour to hour, but others are going to be swiftly discouraged if they're having to make a new character every other session. You can of course tweak the difficulty on the fly, but having an idea of whereabouts you're aiming the difficulty before you begin certainly won't do you any harm. Either way, difficulty is something you'll have to get a feel for as you run a game, and that's okay. Sometimes your players will annihilate your big end boss without breaking a sweat, and sometimes you'll come close to murdering a couple with a combat encounter you thought would be a breeze. Either way, don't worry too much about this, just experiment with different things and it'll come with time. Step two is know the rules. There isn't really any way around this one, I'm afraid, as the DM you're going to have some homework to do. In the course of any given session, your players will be looking to you to guide the action, of course, but they'll also be looking to you to make judgement calls on when they need to roll dice. You're as much a referee as you are a director, so having a good working knowledge of how the game actually works is really important. It increases your players' confidence in your abilities, for one thing, but it also means you don't have to pause the action and dig out a rulebook every two minutes. You don't need to know absolutely everything off by heart, of course, but if a player says something like, I want to try and persuade the guard to let us in, and your first reaction is, cripes, how does that work? That's a problem. Knowing the game intimately will also give you a better idea of how long things will take, which is to say, combat always takes ages, and the quicker you get a handle on that, the better. That's not to say there's any shame in having to look something up, of course, but as a guiding principle, the better you know the rules, the smoother and more fun your game will be. As important as a good working knowledge of the rules is, however, step three is to know when to throw the rules out. When writing an RPG, authors tend to try and have a rule in place for every eventuality. What are the effects on a human when they're making a long journey across a desert without water, for instance? What happens if a player attempts more than the usual number of actions in any given combat round? And how much gear can everybody carry? It's a simple and unavoidable fact that some of these rules get in the way instead of making things fun, and if that's the case, you shouldn't feel bad about tossing those rules out. 
You can discuss things as a group in order to find a compromise that works for everybody, but if there's a particular subset of the rules that strikes you as especially fiddly or unnecessary, don't feel bad about ignoring it. There's a fantastic RPG called Blades in the Dark that I'm currently running a campaign of, and gear in this game is organised into different tiers, which is to say if you're trying to pick a tier 3 lock with a tier 1 lock pick, you're going to have a harder time. And I took that system and I immediately threw it out of my campaign because I didn't really feel like it was adding anything. If a lock is too finely made for a character to pick, then they and I will know it without having to assign a number to both of those things. Giving everything in the world an exact tier rating doesn't really add anything in my estimation, so out it goes. It's worth noting, however, that as DM you have the final say on the rules. Your players might want to get rid of the load limit on their characters, for example, but if you think it impacts on the game in a meaningful way, then it should absolutely stay. Step four is to have a plan. When you're planning an adventure, whether it's one that's going to be wrapped up in a few short hours or one that will span weeks and months of gameplay, it's good to know who the major players are. Who's the group's main antagonist, for example? What does this enemy want? And what resources do they have available to them to see their aims through? Bearing these things in mind will help you weave an interesting narrative around your players as they explore the world, and the clearer the state of play is in your mind, the faster you'll be able to respond to new developments. Notice I say respond, though, because step five is don't plan too much. When people ask me what it's like to run a pen and paper game, I generally say it's like that bit in Wallace and Gromit's The Wrong Trousers when Gromit is riding the toy train and laying the track in front of him as he goes. While you should know generally what's going on in the world you're running and what challenges the players have in store, it's very easy to plan too much or to run too rigid an adventure. Having a detailed plan before a session can be a reassuring thing, especially for a new DM but it can also lead to problems. Your players will almost certainly do something you don't expect, probably right at the beginning, and then that means that some, or maybe even most, of your carefully laid game plan is no longer relevant. This can lead to a moment of horrible, gut-wrenching panic, which is really unpleasant, but worse, it can lead to a temptation to wrest control of the game away from your players in order to put them back on the path you originally envisaged. This is a horrible practice called railroading, and you should really avoid doing it wherever possible. I used to plan a lot when I first started running games, but beyond having a fixed idea of who the bad guys are and what they want, I now try to avoid planning at all. Everyone is different, of course, and you may find a more detailed plan suits your personal style, or maybe you're just into working in cool ideas as and when you can. But I find if I have too much planned, then I'm slower to react to the unexpected. The second D&D adventure I ran for Outside Xbox and Outside Extra is a pretty good example, actually. Going in, I knew Corathon was going to be given the black spot, I knew who had hired the pirates, and I knew why. But apart from that, I didn't have the faintest idea what was going to happen or where the players were going to go in that session. As a result, when they decided to hire out a boathouse and stage an ambush, I wasn't thinking, oh cripes, I didn't plan a boathouse, because I knew that already. I just got on with imagining what that boathouse might look like. If everything's a surprise, in other words, you're far less likely to encounter an unpleasant surprise. I'll emphasise at this point that learning to let go and not really plan anything takes quite a bit of practice. Having a more fleshed out plan is absolutely fine if that's what helps or if that's just how you prefer to play in general. These are all, of course, just guidelines and every DM is different, so the most important thing is to find what works for you. The next tip in this little primer is to make it personal to your players. Simply put, they'll have a better time if your story works in little details from their backstory, or if there's a hook to get them more invested personally. Do you have a character in the group with a missing sister? Maybe they'll turn up and turn out to be a right evil so-and-so. Maybe your players burnt down a barn in their first session because they thought it would be funny. Well, turns out that farm has been tracking them ever since, and they've hired a whole bunch of mercenaries. Developments like these remind your players that the actions they take in the world have consequences, some small, some far-reaching. So whether you're planning something relatively minor or earth-shatteringly significant, it'll lead to a more vibrant, alive-seeming world that they're a real part of. Tip 7 is to be decisive, or rather, not to dither. If you need to look something up in the rules, that's fine. Similarly, if you're struggling to imagine exactly what horrible monster is looming out of the darkness, that's alright too. Inspiration comes and goes. 
What you should really learn to avoid, however, and this is something I learned the hard way, is looking indecisive in front of your players, because frankly it just looks like you're winging it. Which you are, of course, but there's a big difference between a DM who's making things up on the fly and having a good time doing it, and one who's winging it and looks afraid. Even if you're making a judgement call you're not 100% happy with, if you're confident, your players will have confidence in you. Case in point, watch here as I cover the fact I don't know how multi-action combat rounds work in d and <laughs> I'm just going to break this down to two rolls, um, because why not? See? It's easy. The most important tip of all, however, is to know what works for you. It could be that none of the advice I've given you thus far actually applies to you. Like I say, everyone's different. The important thing is to get stuck in. Talk to your players, get a feel for the group, and then see what works for you. The first and most important goal in any pen and paper RPG is to make sure everyone is having fun. If you've achieved that aim, everything else is secondary. Oh, and build playlists. I cannot stress enough the importance of a good soundtrack when you're running a pen and paper RPG. For every single game I run, I make three playlists. I make quiet for general dithering, middle for when things are starting to get tense, and combat for combat. Make sure the music isn't too intrusive, video game and movie soundtracks are good for that, and try to tailor your choices to the game you're playing. If nothing else, it'll be a fun exercise for you to imagine the world as you start to build it. And there you have it, 9 tips for DMing a pen and paper RPG. I am of course just one person however, so I really would relish your thoughts on the matter. If there are any seasoned DMs watching, give us your thoughts. As for any players or budding DMs, why not ask some questions? I'll try to get to them either in the comments or in a future video if this one does well enough. Either way, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see me run some D&D or talk about pen and paper games in general, you can click one of these videos that's surrounding my face right now. Do like and subscribe so you don't miss anything more from Eurogamer. Thanks again for watching and have a lovely day.